The very best wrestling shows are the ones that remind you why you've continued to watch after so many years. While a contemporary product is capable of invoking this chicken soup feeling, oftentimes it's a trip to the well of nostalgia that emphatically hits those feels. Of all the feel-good wrestling reunions that have ever been pieced together, few have been quite as celebrated or heralded as the one held in front of an intimate yet vociferous Big Apple crowd in mid-2005. It was a night of rediscovery, brashness, controversy, and a familiar blend of violence that one might consider even a little bit quaint. I'm Jack from Cultaholic Wrestling, and this is the true story of ECW One Night Stand. More than two decades after the independently run Extreme Championship Wrestling held its final card, the influence of the so-termed little promotion that could is still felt today. Presenting unflinching brutality, catering to a die-hard, in-the-know part of the audience, championing talents that don't conform to the mainstream archetype, displaying all manner of worky, shooty goodness, these elements can all be found in latter-day pro wrestling, and none of them were even remotely standard until ECW carved out its niche following in the mid-90s. ECW, though, grew beyond this niche, settling into sort of a purgatorial plane. As owner Paul Heyman later mused, ECW was too big to be small time and too small to be big time. This was a profound rut that would help doom its business model come 2001, when Heyman was forced to declare bankruptcy many millions in debt. This didn't stop surviving organizations from continuing to appropriate ECW's tenets, ideas, and characters into their own productions. Crowd-encompassing brawls, coarse language, overt sexuality, elevation of the gifted indie darlings, and other pages of the ECW playbook remained in use outside of the walls of the Heyman compound. I mean, Heyman himself even came aboard Vince McMahon's WWE in 2001, followed by fellow extreme refugees like Rhino, Spike Dudley, Jerry Lynn, Tajiri, Tommy Dreamer, and Rob Van Dam. Within TNA's first year of existence in 2002, the likes of Lynn, Raven, Just Incredible, The Sandman, New Jack, and others were often put together to try and recapture some of that South Philly magic. Controversial indie group and former ECW nemesis, XPW, actually moved their operations to the ECW arena in 2002, as the champion slash booker Shane Douglas brought in just about every available alumnus to try and fill the ECW void. Of course, though, none of it was quite the same. ECW was a unique lightning-in-a-bottle revelation that couldn't be consciously duplicated. After all, ECW was ECW because it was original. Another organization trying to recreate ECW cannot, by definition, be original. Still, the existence of the void was felt not just by the industry, but by the fans. The company and its very ethos were sorely missed. And it was even more sorely missed following the release of a particular bit of media. In November of 2004, WWE released The Rise and Fall of ECW, on DVD. The life and times of Extreme Championship Wrestling were given a thorough examination, much of it rosy, other parts very blunt. Heyman and a host of former ECW stars, now working for WWE, regaled the viewer with one of the most engrossing documentaries they had yet released. The DVD set also included seven bonus matches presented in their cozy rawness, heard only, of course, by the music dubs, but that, that's to be expected. While a fondness for the departed ECW had long remained bubbling beneath the surface, this Rise and Fall DVD profoundly struck a chord with the fanbase. In a time before nearly all ECW media was made available on a streaming service, this DVD was just the tonic those lovelorn thrill seekers were crying out for, and it only augmented these cries. Within three months of the DVD's release, Rise and Fall had become WWE's second most bought DVD in their history, trailing only the WrestleMania 20 release. Not long after this, it assumed the top spot, indicating that this desire for all things ECW still burned brightly. About a month after the DVD came out, rumors began circulating that WWE had booked New York's Hammerstein Ballroom for a pay-per-view the following June. The 2,500-seat venue was home to ECW's last two pay-per-views and made the most sense for a WWE 
the authorised recreation of ECW. Word is that Tommy Dreamer even pushed for the smaller, more intimate ECW arena in Philadelphia, but this was apparently turned down. If strong DVD sales weren't enough of a barometer of feelings, a Rhino victory over one-off enhancement talent and fellow Extreme alumnus Danny Doring at the first Sunday Night Heat taping of 2005 drew a very loud pro-ECW response from the Long Island crowd. Though Doring was simply there to do the honours, it was still one half of ECW's final tag team champions getting gored and pinned by the final world champion. And the crowd caught on to the significance here, responding with big chants of ECW, ECW. Reportedly, it was then SmackDown star Rob Van Dam who suggested bringing back ECW for one night. Some believe that RVD asked on behalf of Heyman, who was very unpopular among WWE creative, and feared that the idea would be immediately shot down just on the basis of it being his idea. Most people liked and respected Rob Van Dam, so to come from him, the suggestion might carry a little bit more weight. And so, ECW One Night Stand was incepted. Heyman, understandably, was the man tasked with putting together this special card, although apparently, it wasn't originally intended to be that way. In the early planning stages for One Night Stand, Heyman reportedly wasn't factored in due to alleged prior clashes between he and Creative over the preceding years. By February of 2005, Vince McMahon himself insisted that Heyman be involved. According to Tommy Dreamer, who was involved in the production of the show, it was he that went to bat for Heyman to be involved. McMahon met with Heyman that February, where the ECW boss laid out his plans. He apparently went as far as to produce three different show scripts for One Night Stand, deathly serious about capturing the quintessential ECW spirit. The point about the ECW spirit was something some detractors had noted. That's because it seemed ironic to have a reunion of these rebels and revolutionaries taking place under the banner of a very corporate WWE. WWE was essentially the executor of the ECW estate by acquiring the film library, trademarks, and all that sort of thing, and the idea of WWE presents ECW didn't sit well with everyone. By March, plans for another ECW reunion show were made public. TNA personality Shane Douglas got together with broadcaster and producer Jeremy Borash to begin putting together their own reunion card for the ECW arena, scheduled two nights before one night stand. TNA contracted performers like Douglas himself, Raven, Jerry Lynn, and a few others weren't free, of course, to work a WWE-produced event. Therefore, Douglas could promote a few exclusive wrestlers on his card. That card was originally going to be called Extreme Reunion, but WWE sent them a cease and desist over the use of terms ECW, Extreme Championship Wrestling, and even the word Extreme itself. They couldn't even refer to that famed bingo hall as the ECW Arena. Douglas's opposition card would instead call itself Hardcore Homecoming, and would do all it could to sidestep those trademark landmines. For what it's worth, the Homecoming group released its own documentary called Forever Hardcore. Though it lacks original ECW footage, the documentary itself is a magnificent comparison to the rise and fall of ECW, and includes perspectives from valuable stars who were left out of the WWE production. Soon, there was a battle over which independent stars would work which show, as Dreamer was permitted to bring in outside wrestlers for one night stand, while Douglas had the same access to the free agent pool. The WWE card could already boast Dreamer, the Dudley Boys, Taz, Chris Jericho, Tajiri, Rey Mysterio, Chris Benoit, Eddie Guerrero, and others. But as impressive as this group was, there were certainly gaps that needed filling, and Dreamer knew who to reach out to. A note in the Wrestling Observer newsletter claims that the Sandman, after once saying he had no interest in working the WWE card, received an offer from Dreamer to switch his stance and work One Night Stand instead of Hardcore Homecoming. Dreamer reportedly made similar offers to Just Incredible and Sabu, the latter of whom had ties to TNA but was apparently free enough to pick his own bookings. Ultimately, while WWE once held an us or them mentality regarding the two cards, they did soften their stance, allowing any non-contracted WWE performers to work both shows if they so desired. Still though, some notable names weren't at One Night Stand. Terry Funk, for example, committed to Hardcore Homecoming, reportedly turning down an offer three times greater than what he was accepting. He felt the way Douglas did, that Vince shouldn't be the one profiting from the ECW legacy and didn't want to be part of that, although of course Funk did change his mind one year later. Funk's participation at Hardcore Homecoming was to take part in a three-way dance with Douglas and Sabu, a callback to their landmark 1994 ECW title match that resulted in an hour-long draw. One name was unable to make it to One Night Stand, that being the original gangster, New Jack. The former ECW Tag Team Champion reportedly had one or more outstanding warrants in the state of New York, but was working to resolve them before showtime. Alas, 
it didn't happen. Former ECW champion Steve Carino turned down both cards, reportedly telling fellow former ECW star C.W. Anderson, I want to be the dick that turns it down. I've moved past that. In early May, the then TNA booker Dusty Rhodes said on an episode of Live Audio Wrestling that he would allow TNA wrestlers to work the WWE card. However, Dixie Carter herself wouldn't allow for that crossover, so Dusty's verbal gesture was sadly moot. One TNA talent found a way around that, disgruntled former X Division champion Kid Cash, who secured a release from TNA in mid-April after many, many months of frustration with the company. As the penultimate ECW television champion, Kid Cash seemed like a lock to make his mark on that June weekend. By late April, word of some of the One Night Stand plans were leaked. Heyman wanted absolute authenticity, from a lack of pyro to lower production values in general, to the classic brick wall entrance set, to using the old referees, as well as Atlas security for protective detail. While fans could be forgiving of lackluster reunion show bouts in deference to, say, some performers' advanced age, WWE was looking at the possibility of revisiting ECW down the line, should One Night Stand be successful. They didn't want the audience to associate future shows with wrestlers that they had learned can't go anymore. Therefore, only the still capable need apply. All in all, six of the seven matches were announced ahead of time. In what promised to be a hardcore war, Tommy Dreamer and the Sandman would reunite to face Bubba Ray and Devon Dudley. On the technical side of things, Chris Benoit would take on Eddie Guerrero. Calling back to their 1995 matches that raised the bar of ECW showcases, Rey Mysterio was matched up with Psychosis, and in three-way action, the 1999 rivalry between Yoshihiro Tajiri, Super Crazy, and Little Guido would dust it off. In a match that had never taken place in ECW in any form, former TV champion Chris Jericho would face former Thrill Seeker's tag partner Lance Storm. And after those five matches were announced, a big sixth match was added, pitting longtime rivals Mike Awesome and Masato Tanaka against one another. There was also supposed to be a match on Sunday Night Heat, with final tag team champions Danny Doring and Roadkill facing C.W. Anderson and Johnny Swinger. However, the match was a late scratch from the show, due to WWE deciding they didn't want the unique atmosphere of the venue to be spoiled on the pre-show. Instead, they saved that reveal for when the pay-per-view started. On paper, these all look like fantastic matches, but oddly enough, none of them were ever promoted on television. The TV build to One Night Stand centered around Raw General Manager Eric Bischoff expressing his disgust for the company that he used to steal talent from, and the promotion that regularly lobbed insults his way. I mean, the WCW-ECW rivalry was a very contentious one, to be sure. Bischoff's annoyance led to Raw superstar Chris Benoit, of all people, taking up defense of ECW. Mind you, Benoit only worked for ECW off and on for about a year in 94 and 95. He reigned as tag team champion there for six weeks with Dean Malenko and infamously broke Sabu's neck, which earned him his future crippler nickname. That being said, it did feel a little weird to suddenly see Benoit become enthusiastic and nostalgic about ECW. He even went so far as to challenge Tajiri to an ECW-style match in which Benoit went heavy on weapon use, which is something he wasn't even really known for during his ECW run. Now granted, this was little more than an explicit commercial for the pay-per-view. Having a recognized star of a popular WWE TV show endorse ECW to parts of the audience that might not have been familiar with it. But to an ECW diehard, this was an infomercial that didn't exactly tell the story right. But ultimately, Benoit's part in the build was minuscule. The road to One Night Stand was paved by Bischoff and other assorted WWE heels like Kurt Angle, JBL, Edge, and others wanting to ruin the extreme festivities. And so the villainous horde decided to show up to the Hammerstein Ballroom, casting a possible black cloud over the event. The build also included a rather memorable TV segment where the three famed promoters of 1990s American wrestling all shared the ring together. Bischoff attempted to hold a funeral for ECW on the May 23rd Raw, which brought out Vince McMahon to both insult Bischoff and to admit to his own financial stake in wanting to see One Night Stand succeed. Then, of course, Heyman came out and gave his typical hard sell sermon, capping off a segment that fans of the 90s probably never thought they'd see. After a few weeks of physical altercations between the ECW originals and the WWE dissenters, a whirlwind of chaos, electricity, and curiosity descended upon the Hammerstein Ballroom on June 12th, 2005. One Night Stand was upon us. 48 hours after Hardcore Homecoming really hit out of the park in South Philadelphia, many of the principals from that feel-good card ventured up Interstate 95 to Manhattan, where a larger pay-per-view audience waited to see the renewed adventures of the revived ECW name. From the jump, 
It felt like old times. A raucous New York crowd chanted those three familiar letters leading into the Harry Slash Helm theme song and an appearance from a clearly emotional Joey Styles. Styles was soon joined on commentary by Mick Foley who at one juncture was asked to wrestle on the show as Cactus Jack but wouldn't commit at the time to a highly physical performance. It didn't take long for the action to hit high gear. Storm and Jericho tore the house down in a hot opener, accessorized by Jericho wearing his old Lionheart gear and the fans chanting unsavory things at Storm's valet Dawn Marie. J just like old times, eh? A cane shot from the interfering Just Incredible gave Lance Storm the win. According to Jericho, he requested Storm as his opponent on the basis that Storm was on the verge of retiring. As the two were each other's first ever opponent in the business, Jericho thought it was appropriate that they face off one more time before Lance hung up the boots. From there, the thrills and spills only intensified. Tajiri, Super Crazy, and Little Guido's three-way dance was littered with interference and high-wire stunts before Crazy polished off Tajiri with a series of moonsaults. This was followed by Rey Mysterio and Psychosis's very earnest attempt to turn back the clock. Unfortunately, it was, it was hampered somewhat by two things. One, Mysterio was wearing his modern wardrobe as opposed to going retro like Jericho. And two, Psychosis was working a slower, more deliberate style, which some people speculated was his attempt to get a job with WWE. And indeed, Psychosis did debut as one of the Mexicools just a month later. Towards the end of the match, fans booed the WWE-centric 619 signature move, but did appreciate Rey Mysterio's springboard Rana finish. To this point, in dispersing the action were video packages packages of classic ECW moments, as well as a montage of alumni that had passed on since 2001, including the recently departed Chris Candido. After Ray's victory over Psychosis, the WWE antagonists arrived, taking their place in the ballroom balcony. JBL and Kurt Angle cut inflammatory promos and received some very vulgar chants in return. Ultimately, they were interrupted by Rob Van Dam, who was unable to wrestle after tearing his leg up earlier in the year. Nonetheless, he cut an impassioned promo on the intruders, extolling the ECW spirit before getting gored by Rhino. The Man Beast had been fired from WWE in April, something the crowd were happy to remind him about, and this appearance came during the final weeks of Rhino's non-compete before he signed with TNA. Saving Van Damme was Sabu, of course, leading to an impromptu match between former ECW champions. RVD did manage to give Rhino a skateboard dropkick using a steel chair before Sabu finished with an Arabian skull crusher. After all, few things are more ECW than Joey Styles shrieking his signature, oh my god, while Sab that was terrible, apologies, while Sabu does something regrettable. Really, yes, there's nothing more ECW than that. From there, Benoit defeated Guerrero in a mostly solid technical encounter, albeit a compromised one. A combination of fans being distracted by goings-on in the WWE balcony, as well as Eddie being unhappy about doing a clean job so soon after executing a huge heel turn on SmackDown, led to Latino Heat largely giving a lackluster performance by his very, very high standards. He and Benoit reportedly had heated words backstage after the match. One performance that more than delivered was Mike Awesome and Tanaka's barbaric chair and table duel. The two beat each other mercilessly in what most consider to be match of the night. Awesome finished his longtime nemesis with an out of the ring awesome bomb through a table and a subsequent dive onto his crumpled foe. Word after the show was that WWE wanted to sign Awesome on the merit of his strong performance, that and the fact of course that he's a towering badass. However, Awesome never wrestled again, opting to go back into retirement until his tragic passing in 2007. After that spectacle, Heyman came out next, first to thank the fans and then to entertain them with a wild tirade directed towards the WWE invaders. He openly dropped the kind of forbidden name at the time of Matt Hardy to a stunned edge amid that whole messy situation, before reminding JBL that he was only ever WWE champion because Triple H didn't feel like going to SmackDown, a remark that apparently really cracked up Vince McMahon. Verbal violence volleyed back to physical violence in a main event that was very much ECW personified. The tie-dye wearing Dudleys stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tommy Dreamer and the Sandman. The latter, of course, entering to his trademark Metallica music at Heyman's vehement insistence, cost be damned. Just about everyone ran in on this match, including the Blue World Order, Balls Mahoney, Axel Rotten, Kid Cash, the Impact players, Francine, Beulah, and even Spike Dudley. Blood was spilled, foreheads were grated, and flames reached for the sky as Bubba powerbombed Dreamer through a fiery table to finish the fight. But wait, there's more. 
Steve Austin, wearing an XFL jersey, maybe in honor of another organization that crashed and burned in 2001, arrived on the scene to call out the gate crashes for a full-scale brawl between factions. And indeed, the groups did clash, with Taz memorably showing up with his shredded towel and all to do something he'd done once before, choke Kurt Angle unconscious in New York. But while the gratifying beatdown of Eric Bischoff and subsequent beer bash put a nice shiny bow on a memorable night, not all was well. During the closing scenes, one couldn't help but notice that the Blue Meanie was bleeding very heavily. That's because during the group brawl, he had an altercation with JBL that went outside the bounds of kayfabe. JBL reportedly attacked Meanie due to comments that Meanie had made in a prior shoot interview about JBL being a bully, which the larger JBL didn't really do a great job of dispelling with this attack. When Meany later publicly stated that he was considering legal action, WWE signed him to a short-term deal, let him go over JBL in a SmackDown match in which Stevie Richards gave JBL a brain-rattling chair shot and then booked Meany in a six-man tag at the Great American Bash. Plus, Meany adds as well, they doubled his one-night stand payoff. And for what it's worth, JBL and Meany eventually buried the hatchet, so, you know, that's nice. In addition to the confrontation between JBL and Meany and the one between Guerrero and Benoit, there was also contentious feeling between Francine and Dawn Marie. The two reportedly weren't on friendly terms going back to their ECW days and an alleged moment of disrespect nearly kicked up a physical altercation between them backstage at One Night Stand. And this especially wouldn't have been good because Dawn Marie was several months pregnant. Thankfully, cooler heads prevailed in that instance. While all wasn't entirely friendly behind the scenes at One Night Stand, there were greater feelings among those who saw the show. While none of the matches were epic length struggles, each was an enjoyable primer into what made ECW special, and nothing overstayed its welcome. There were no five star matches, but probably nothing below three stars either. Today, One Night Stand is hailed as one of the greatest productions ever put on by WWE, a tribute that was mostly true to ECW's ideals and allowed the company to have a proper send off. Well, if only. As of the production of this video, ECW One Night Stand has a 9.1 rating out of a possible 10 on the cagematch.net database, with nearly 200 users in all rating the event. 71% of reviewers gave the show a 9 or a 10, while 94% gave it an 8 or better. And business-wise, One Night Stand accounted for 325,000 buys on pay-per-view, as many as the previous year's Survivor Series and more than any secondary WWE pay-per-view of its time. According to Scott E. Williams' Hardcore History, Vince was led to believe that if the pay-per-view did 175,000 buys, it should be considered a success. Kevin Dunn reportedly told Vince that the coarse loudness of the ECW faithful throughout the years made the company seem bigger than it actually was, and that he shouldn't expect a sizable buy rate for one night stand. Yeah, about that, Kevin. As for what Vince thought of the show, Jericho recalls McMahon saying after Awesome vs Tanaka, I wouldn't want to have a pay-per-view like this every month, but it's definitely very unique. Though the ECW presence on WWE programming ceased in the fallout of One Night Stand, it continued elsewhere. TNA infused their programming with decidedly stronger extreme flavor, putting its world title on Raven, pushing Rhino and Sabu near the top of the card, and giving Jerry Lynn a renewed push. Shane Douglas's hardcore homecoming continued on into the autumn, last running that November at the, don't call it ECW, arena. And both groups, both TNA and Hardcore Homecoming, gained access to the Dudleys after Bubba and Devon left WWE at the expiration of their deals in August. And of course, WWE did revisit ECW the following year with another memorable one-night stand, followed by the launch, unfortunately, of the ECW brand. The brand's existence was contingent on the re-signing of Paul Heyman, whose WWE contract would have expired in early 2006. WWE didn't want TNA or anyone else to get their mitts on the caustic booker, and following the home run that was the first one-night stand, Heyman thereby gained a little bit more leverage in earning a favorable deal to stick around with WWE. Without consideration to anything that took place after the fact, the 2005 one-night stand was a fitting love letter to the ECW that everyone remembered. It may have been a WWE production, but Heyman fingerprints were all over the product, and the unrestrained wrestlers got to have their matches. Their style of matches, I suppose. There were a few warts, of course, but that's ECW, a proud grin with some mangled teeth. Without a genuine match of the year candidate, apart from maybe Awesome Tanaka if that's your style, ECW One Night Stand still resides in that very exclusive pantheon of wrestling cards that are considered genuine classics. You can nitpick here and there and you can offer alternative ideas, but if the best wrestling shows are the one that easily reaffirm one's fandom, then ECW One Night Stand is as close to perfection as a card really needs to be. I've been Jack from Cultaholic and that was the true story of ECW One Night Stand.